Welcome back to the Governance Podcast. Today we'll be talking about the market reaction to Liz Truss's mini budget and what it says about public debt, the housing market, pensions, and democracy's relationship to central banking. I'm Stephen Klein, lecturer of political theory in the Department of Political Economy. I'm very pleased uh, to be in, joining, joined in this conversation by Martin Wheel, uh, professor of economics in the Department of Political Economy as well as the Business School. Professor Wheel, um, in addition to being a prolific researcher and regular public commentator, uh, he served on the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee for two terms, from 2010 to 2016, I believe as an external member, or is there a specific uh, position that you're in? Or no, is that there... was an external member. Okay, very good, um, which means he's extremely well equipped, I think, to, to discuss some of the things that have been happening in the last few weeks. So Martin, thanks so much for being here and joining me for this conversation. Well, it's a pleasure. So I want to just start by thinking a little bit about and talking about sort of what specifically has happened and helping our listeners understand the specific mechanisms and dynamics that led to us being where we are today. Um, so maybe the place to start is with you just saying a little bit about why, in your view, the mini budget caused such concern and panic in financial markets. And why was this sort of different from, for example, the additional spending we saw during the pandemic or even with the announced um, subsidies for energy costs? Well, when governments borrow money, it's the same as when people borrow money. Those who lend to them worry about whether they're going to be able to repay it. And uh, of course, a key guide to that is whether your debt is rising faster or slower than your income in the medium term. If debt's rising faster than income, then you're doing too much borrowing. If income's rising faster than debt, then things are under control. Now, the problem with the mini budget was that the government didn't produce any projections about what was likely to be happening to debt and income in the medium term, and that was their decision. So as a result, the markets decided to jump to their own conclusions. Uh, they couldn't see how the tax cuts were to be paid for, and they were worried that, no, this was perhaps going to mean more inflation in the future, or that, well, that would have been the easiest way of managing it, uh, or they were just very uncertain about the framework for policy making. Why was this different from additional spending during the epidemic or no, the energy price cap? And I think the answer is that in the short term, markets can absorb quite a lot. The concern is about the path of debt relative to income in the medium term. Great. And so um, that's super helpful. And, and so, you know, as people, you know, as the crisis was unfolding, there were these larger concerns, but it was playing out in particular in markets for what are called gilts and increasing yield on long-term gilts. Um, uh, so uh, maybe it would be helpful to say a little bit sort of about what gilts are, um, in case people don't know, and what their yield signifies about investors' perceptions of the UK economy. So why did this perception lead to increase in, in uh, the yield of uh, gilts, or this perception that there's going to be an unsustainable path of debt uh, in uh, government spending? Well, when you and I borrow money, we take out a mortgage or a bank loan or something like that. When the UK government borrows money, it issues securities called government debt, gilt-edged securities, and gilt-edged because they were assumed to be completely safe. Uh, the rate of interest that it has to pay on those depends on the market appetite for them. And in the uncertain situation created by the mini budget, this question of how debt was going to be managed in the future, what was the government's economic framework and was it coherent, given all that uncertainty, people wanted a higher return on their investments than would otherwise have been the case because they felt they were running extra risk. Very good. And um, I, as I'm curious, I mean, this is very hard to uh, judge, but to what extent do you think this was an issue ultimately about the government's ability, the fact that they didn't get the budget forecasting done by the Office of Bud Budget Management, the uncertainty that produced versus the spending itself. Do you think there's a world in which if they had gotten, if they'd gone through more regular procedures, the, gov the markets would have reacted less aggressively? Or do you think ultimately this was just, uh, I mean, I know this is a hard question to answer because it's a hypothetical sort of, but I, I guess I'm curious about how much this is about the uncertainty 
that just announcing a budget creates versus the actual trajectory that the budget signifies? Or is it just inevitably going to be a mix of well, both of those things? Well, I think if the government had produced a report from the Office for Budget Responsibility, it would have shown debt rising relative to income and uh, that would have alarmed markets. So yeah. I don't think it was the absence of a report showing that there was no obvious mechanism for managing yeah, government yeah. borrowing. It was the fact that market me people investing in government debt believed there was no mechanism for managing government borrowing. And in my view, they were right to believe that. Very good. And I, should, I think I call it the Office of Budget Management, which is an American office in the White House. So um, yeah, the, the Office of Budget Responsibility. Very good. Um, yeah, and so then what are some of the implications of um, increase in, in guilt yields, so the increase in interest rates that we see both for the government's policy making, but also for the economy as a whole? Well, I think it's bad news for both the government and for the taxpayer and for the economy as a whole. If Britain is regarded as a risky country in which to invest, then the government has to pay a higher interest rate when it borrows. And that, of course, means that the taxpayer has to pay more tax to pay the interest on government debt. Uh, secondly, the interest on government debt defines the market for borrowing in the UK. So it also means that people who take out mortgages are going to have to pay more for their mortgages than would have been the case without the policy fiasco. Good, good. Um, uh... And so, yeah, so it leads to an increase in the cost of borrowing. For the, it, can, it, can, it can itself contribute to an economic slowdown in the economy as a whole if it's perceived now that there's a riskier trajectory of government spending, is part of what you're saying. Yes, indeed. What it means is that uh, no, if the government is borrowing more, then taxes have to be higher in the future. Yeah, yeah. which undermines the entire point of the mini, which undermined kind of the entire point of the mini budget, which was to try to spur growth. Well, taxes. the government believed that the mini budget would spur growth in the medium and long term, and no one else swallowed that. <laughs> uh, good. And so I want to turn now uh, to thinking uh, or to talking a little bit about the sort of specific turmoil and how the um, change in these interest rates on government bonds or gilts led to potential larger risk than maybe people fully anticipated in um, uh, different segments of the UK economy. So there's a lot of coverage over the last few weeks of what happened at pension funds in the UK as the interest rates on government bonds um, started going up, existing government bonds, so the yields on the gilts went up. So why were these pension funds particularly exposed to an increase in gilt yields? Why did it start leading to turmoil in uh, the pension funds? Well, pension funds make promises to pay pensions in the long term, in the future, the cost of those depends on the interest rate. And the pension funds had been very concerned about the long period of falling interest rates that we had from about 1980 until last year. That was adding to the cost of providing pensions and putting pension, you know, the ability to pay those pensions at some risk. So what pension funds did was to buy derivatives which would protect them from that risk. If interest rates fell further, then the pension funds would be compensated for that. If interest rates, you know, and by contrast, rose, then the pension funds would face a loss. But the argument was that wouldn't matter because the future pensions that they were going to pay would, in effect, get more, cheaper. Yeah, become more valuable. Now, yeah. if the pension funds had enough money at the moment to meet all of their pension costs, then that would have been the, you know, the end of it. But, or at least they wouldn't have been particularly exposed. But the problem they faced was that uh, you know, quite a lot of pension funds are in deficit and their, asset, their liabilities you know, exceeded their assets. But even for those, actually, for those funds that weren't in deficit, uh, as the interest rate in the gilt market rose sharply, the people who were providing the derivatives essentially asked for margin calls. They wanted to be sure that pension funds could meet the losses. Mm -hmm. And the only way in which the pension funds were able to do that was by selling 
things that they could sell quickly and those are government securities. There's a very big market for them. They're much easier to sell than other things like shares, let alone, of course, buildings. Yes, yes. As the pension funds were selling these government securities, not surprisingly, the price of them fell. A fall in the price of government securities is effectively an increase in the interest rate on them. So as the pension funds were selling, interest rates in the long term market, though the cost of borrowing for 20 years or 30 years was rising, and that triggered further losses and triggered the need for more sales. So, so this is what the, you're talking about as the doom loop. This was the so-called doom loop. So the only way out of that, or at least not the only way out of that, but the way out of that that the Bank of England adopted was to intervene in the market for government securities, to buy gilts so as to provide the pension funds cash without letting the price of gilts fall further. Very good. Yeah. I have a question about that, but before, I just want to make sure that I understand. This is something I've been trying to sort of make sure I'm clear on. So the the relationship between the, the interest rate on a gilt and its current value, because when you when the government issues gilts, they pay out a fixed amount at interim periods, right? So the interest rate can have initially get set, but the market interest rate is determined by the actual, how much you can sell that gilt for today. So if the value of the gilt falls by 10%, then suddenly those payouts are worth more. And so the actual yield of the gilt goes up. Is that correct? So the reason that kind of the, the current value of a gilt, when it drops, its yield goes up is because those the ratio of its current price to the fixed payments you get over time has improved. And so, you know, because I can imagine a world in which people sort of say, well, why wouldn't a higher interest rate on a gilt mean that it's worth more? But in fact, what's really going on is that the current market value of those gilts is dropping because the debt is seen as less valuable or less reliable. So it's, there's a premium if you want to sell a bond today. And so the future payout of those bonds become more valuable relative to its current price. Is that right? Is that a, a useful way to, or am I getting it correctly? No, I, I, think, I think that's correct. I think perhaps the best way of understanding it is with a simple example. Suppose the government issues a security that promises to pay three pounds a year forever. Mm -hmm. If the interest rate on that security is 3%, then that security is worth £100. If the actual market interest rate is 6%, then that security is only worth £50. Good. So the current value of the, of the government bond can go up or down depending on how it compares to the prevailing market interest rate, which is precisely what led got pension funds in trouble. Selling these bonds, the, the value of the bonds dropped relatively rapidly, and so when they're trying to sell them to acquire more liquidity, they're suddenly worth less than they initially were. And so they have to sell even more to acquire the, rel the amount of cash that they need to meet these margin calls. No, that was exactly what was happening. Yeah. And I mean, it's also worth pointing out that the movements in the long term interest rate were extremely large compared with historical yeah. experience. Yeah. So it's um, it's not it's not just the quantity of change, but also the rate of change. The fact that it was changing so quickly, so much left these pension funds particularly exposed to yeah. this, yes. and this the, and situation. Yes, and they were getting very sudden calls for quite yeah, a lot of yeah. money. So, um, and so this is the, what you were talking about earlier is what people often describe as liability, or the specific products that they were buying, right, were, I, as I understand, called liability-driven investment uh, products that BlackRock and other asset management companies were selling. I guess one question is, do you think that this was a situation where the pension funds were taking on excessive risk or were unaware of the risk that these liability driven investment models where you take out these derivatives were giving or was it kind of a, an understandable behavior given the long period of low interest rates? Should they have been anticipating more that there were going to be rate increases coming over the next few years and maybe unwinding some of these uh, sorts of exposure? These, these hedging against low interest rates. Well, it's important to remember that the liability-driven investment was to protect the pension funds from the risk that interest rates would fall further. And, you know, as I think I explained, if interest rates rose rather than falling further, that actually makes, uh, you know, makes the cost of providing pensions come down. Mm -hmm. So the argument was even though you get a loss 
on your liability driven investment mm -hmm. that's matched by a reduction in the cost of providing the pensions and in that sense it was a hedge. Now obviously if the pension funds had known that there was going to be such a sharp increase mm -hmm. in interest rates they would probably have wanted to be owning different things <laughs> uh, and equally though know, had people thought that likely then there would probably have been requirements on them to hold cash you know, mm -hmm. give a minimum amount of cash in normal circumstances to protect themselves from margin calls. Yeah, yeah. So we have learnt a bit more about a vulnerability that uh, we didn't know they had, but the fundamentals of liability-driven investment to protect pension funds from falling interest rates, I think, were probably sound. Very good. Um, and so I want to then ask you a bit more as well about the Bank of England's intervention into the gilt markets in response to this turmoil. So, you know, I think some people found that surprising given that, so we had, as you know, because you're on the Bank of England Monetary Policy Board, a decade of unconventional monetary policy of quantitative easing where governments or the banks were repurchasing government bonds on secondary markets. And then as I understand more recently, they've been indicating that they want to engage in what's quantitative tightening where they start to sell those bonds back onto the market. But of course, what the Bank of England had to do was now reopen its, ability, its purchasing of these bonds on secondary markets to help the pension funds. So what were some of the potential risks or you know, issues that the Bank of England had to think about when it was making these decisions to buy, repurchase these gilts? I mean, part of what I'm thinking is like, what's the balance between helping these pension funds, but also not reopening the, the sort of general support for gilt markets that would then potentially undermine or or stop the right the general rise of interest rates which the bank of england also seems to think is necessary at this moment well that was exactly the challenge that they had decided at the monetary policy committee meeting at the end of september to reduce the banks owning the banks stock of government debt and instead the bank found itself increasing it now it that I, i'm sure was well, that, that tension I'm sure was an important part of the reason why it said that the policy was very much time limited, that it was giving time to the pension funds to sort themselves out and they'd better use that time sensibly. Uh, but of course a separate issue was that the Bank of England didn't want to be seen as uh, you know, a sort of backstop that was always prepared to bail out the government if it made bad policy decisions. The Bank of England, I'm sure, was very alarmed at the idea that it might be seen as a sort of funder of last resort for government borrowing when the government didn't like the interest rate it was having to pay in the market. So those were in the background. Yeah. But uh, the sort of basic resolution of that was very much to limit the intervention. And of course, they talked about being prepared to make 65 billion uh, of purchases and in the end I think bought only 19 billion. Yeah yeah this is a lot like in some ways when the ECB was bringing some of the backstops often they weren't actually utilized the existence of the backstop is more important than the actual execution because it's itself going to calm the de the pressure on gilts is that right it kind of stabilizes the market even if it's not being utilized or is it just that maybe the scope of the problem wasn't as large well, as they anticipated? Well the, the, there was considerable volatility in the market even after the Bank of England started its intervention, but uh, you know, what we have seen that's what's fundamentally calmed the market is a belief that uh, economic policy is you know, now going to take account of the arithmetic of government borrowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to get back to that, but before I feel like, before we turn to the kind of general political situation, mm -hmm. the other part of this that obviously is very significant for um, British politics and society is what are the effects going to be of these larger interest, higher interest rates on the economy as a whole? And so I wonder, well, first of all, if you could just explain very briefly, why does the change in the yield on government debt in these secondary markets, the increase in interest rates there, translate, for example, into higher interest rates for homeowners if they're um, on a variable rate mortgage or if their mortgage is up for a renewal? What's the kind of transmission mechanism between the Bank of England's decisions and then the rate of interest that ordinary consumers or ordinary citizens pay uh, on something like a mortgage? Well, essentially the interest rate on government debt provides the reference point for interest rates throughout the economy. 
So if people are thinking about a two-year mortgage to fixed for two years, then it will be the interest rate on two-year government debt that uh, determines or is the major determinant of how much they're going to have to pay. Uh, if they're thinking of a five-year mortgage, it will be the interest rate on five-year government debt. So this increase in interest rates on government debt does feed straight through to the interest rates on new borrowing for the housing market. And so, and what do you think some of the implications of this might then be? I mean, we're coming off of a decade of very low interest rates, um, which enabled all sorts of, which shaped especially housing markets. And so I just, I'm curious if in your, if you have a sense that maybe um, uh, housing is more vulnerable to these sorts of volatility today than it has been in the past. And if this in some ways constrains like what the government can do in terms, you know, if it is going to put a lot of political pressure for example, on the government to really ensure that they kind of moderate increases in, in, in interest rates. And so there's a tension between, say, the tax cutting aspect of what they want to do and preserving or, or um, moderating the effects of interest rate increases on ordinary people. Or has this always been the case that this is just one of the ways in which higher interest rates affect the economy as a whole is that people suddenly might face larger mortgage uh, payments? Well, John Major famously said, if it isn't hurting, it isn't working. Mm -hmm. Uh, when he was talking about interest rate increases in uh, 1990, as far as I remember. So that is the mechanism by which interest rates work. What I do expect, though, is that there'll be a downward adjustment in house prices and probably more than a trivial one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the sort of tension that that's likely to create is that... Uh, people will be saying, and this is to some extent correct, that this is a consequence of the aftermath of the mini budget and therefore the government's directly to blame for it. Uh, and you could imagine that, uh, you know, OK, young people don't vote as much as they should, but uh, people who've lent their children or given their money children to buy houses and then see their children getting into difficulties with mm -hmm. their mortgages won't uh, look very kindly on the government. This is, uh, this is something else I just wanted to mention. I mean, in your experience, has there ever been such a clear-cut instance where a single government decision has led to such turmoil and uncertainty in financial markets? Like, it was something somehow unusual about how directly there seemed to be a relationship between this one... This is part of what I was also asking earlier about kind of the difference between, say, the spending for the pandemic, these short-term spending. And it seems like it was a kind of unusually direct reaction to a government policy announcement. Is that your perception of it as well? Well, I think it was an unusually direct reaction. What uh, you know, we have seen is the same sort of thing the other way round. When Gordon Brown announced that the Bank of England was to become independent, mm -hmm. that led to a sharp fall in the interest rate on government mm -hmm. debt. Mm -hmm. And even before the mini budget, of course, the government had been sniping at the Bank of England, sniping at uh, the Office for Budget Responsibility and so on. And that had probably had some effect in pushing up long term interest rates. Mm -hmm. Although one of the things I found very confusing is I felt like the, tr the supporters of the prime minister who were attacking the Bank of England were critical of it for being somewhat dovish on monetary policy. So they often were saying that they didn't raise interest rates quickly enough, which seems at complete cross purposes with what the mini budget was about, which was kind of lo lowering taxes to, to spur growth. So it seems sort of somehow confusing that they were both very critical of the Bank of England for keeping rates so low through the end of the pandemic when inflation was starting, and yet were so, you know, didn't want their mini budget to lead to the spike of interest rates. No, I think that's a perfectly fair point yeah. that... Uh, Governments typically do want things that are inconsistent with each other, <laughs> and uh, this government probably is no different in that respect. Yeah. And so what, So I want to turn now a little bit to, to talking about some of the broader political uh, kind of questions that this raises. And in particular, I think what, you know, there's this long-running debate that was occurring throughout the post-2008 financial crisis, and that I think this is kind of another moment in, which is really about how should we think about the relationship between fiscal and monetary authorities. So the side, you know, one branch of government that is in charge of monetary policy and setting interest rates, and the other that's in charge of fiscal decisions, taxation and spending. And um, yeah, I'm curious maybe if you can 
sort of, again, maybe just very briefly explain sort of what is the typical view of that relationship and, and in what way does that, do we see that relationship playing out again in um, the, the way that, for example, the governor of the Bank of England reacts to things like the mini budget where suddenly he is very aware that to maintain his own credibility, he has to signal that he's willing to raise interest rates, which can undermine, say, the fiscal goals of the government. Um, yeah, maybe just a kind of very brief uh, explainer of sort of how those two sorts of authority relate. Yes, well, certainly the argument for an independent monetary authority is that if you set up an independent body and give it the job, the primary job of keeping inflation under control, then workers, people negotiating pay rises, businesses setting their prices will do so on the assumption that inflation will be kept under control. Whereas if you have a political body making the decisions, then people will think that uh, they're likely to be influenced by short-term political considerations. Now, of course, you might say, why doesn't that apply to fiscal decision-making as well as monetary decision-making? And I think the <clears throat> issue is rather that with fiscal decision-making, you're imposing taxes on people. Mm -hmm. And uh, the view is that only an elected body should be doing that. Only an elected body has the authority to do that. Uh, <clears throat> that, of course, means that you could, in principle, have the monetary authority and the fiscal authority operating at cross-purposes. That typically hadn't been the case until the mini-budget, when, just as the Bank of England was talking of putting up interest rates in order to bring inflation under control, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister were talking of the need to cut, the need to cut taxes in order to get growth going. Now, um, good. And so in the tr kind of one question I've been wondering about, I've seen a lot of kind of people questioning this, you know, the typical model then of how this goes is the worry is that fiscal policy will overheat the economy. So governments will have this incentive to stimulate the economy to get reelected. It'll lead to kind of ex booming economies, but that will be a kind of artificial boom and it'll ge then generate inflation. And then the central bank needs to kind of adjust or prevent that by raising interest rates independently of the government. Of course, right now, you know, I, it doesn't feel necessarily like the British economy is booming. And if you look at growth, you know, it's been relatively weak, even, say, compared to the U.S. or other countries coming out of the pandemic. And so it's an unusual situation where it seems like the Bank of England is raising interest rates with a lot of economic headwinds. So, you know, so it's a kind of more situ And so I wonder how that factors into Bank of England decision making about monetary policy. So if you have, I, and the kind of follow up is there's, I've read arguments of people who are essentially wondering about the wisdom of raising rates if inflation is primarily a supply shock driven phenomenon rather than a demand driven phenomenon. So I'm curious how you think about some, some of those dilemmas. Well, first I'd say on the question of whether the Britain's economy is booming, if you look at the labour market at the moment, mm -hmm. it is extremely tight. Mm -hmm that uh, unemployment is at its lowest for 50 years, the level of vacancies is extremely high. Uh, now, the economy isn't growing very rapidly because at the same time people are leaving the labour market mm -hmm. and in that sense the United Kingdom is different from I think all the other OECD countries. People are leaving the labour market so that's having the effect of depressing output mm -hmm. but the Bank of England still needs to worry about the balance of demand relative to supply. Mm -hmm. And uh, it looks to many people, including me, that there's quite an imbalance there, yeah. that demand is high relative to supply. Now, separately, of course, the economy isn't growing very much because productivity growth is very weak, but that's not something that can be resolved just by having a higher level of demand. Yeah, yeah. So in some ways, it's a bit of a, a you know, there's a way in which there's some real challenges in reconciling some of the, you know, because one worry could be that higher interest rates could, you know, undermine certain forms of demand-driven investment that could increase productivity, right? I mean, this is kind of a Keynesian story that you need demand induces some of those investments. But it sounds like, I, I, I'm just curious about this kind of, 
the unique situation that the UK, maybe not unique, but the distinctive situation the UK seems to be in, where it's in some ways it seems like caught between a rock and a hard place, where it has high inflation, like you say, a very tight labor market, but these other forces that are undermining economic. And so it's not, you could say, the typical story where you have a kind of generally booming economy, that interest rate. And I feel like this is part of the tension that the fiscal authorities find themselves in now, where obviously they have very strong electoral incentives to encourage growth. But if you have all these structural factors that are undermining growth and you have high inflation, it seems like they have very limited space to undertake policies that might have those sorts of effects. Well, you know, Britain's had a number of experiments of trying to run a high level of demand in order to get investment rising rapidly mm -hmm. and in order to get productivity growing rapidly, and none of them have worked. Uh, and well, I think they tend not to work in other countries yeah. either. And this was kind of, this, I was a little bit leaning to what I thought, you know, what will potentially be our sort of last line of discussion, which is, so, you know, the mini budget was a very clear proximate cause to a rapid spike of inter in interest rates. But, um, you know, I think there's a question about whether the larger inflationary environment, the things we're sort of talking about, would have meant that some sort of fiscal or monetary crisis like this could have also occurred under a Labour government um, if they introduced some of the plans that they seem to be committed to in terms of investment and also having supported some of these tax cuts. Um, and so that's kind of the question is, is um, whether the mini budget was just a kind of proximate cause for um, uh, something that was ultimately being driven by some of these deeper structural issues in the British economy. And if so, does, what does that say about the possibility of democratic choice or control over government spending in, in this sort of environment? Well, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right that the fiscal position has been shown to be extremely tight. And what we've also seen is that just as the a conservative government can't ignore markets, so it seems very unlikely that a Labour government would be able to ignore markets. And it seems to me very unlikely that a Labour, mar a Labour government would be able to make convincing promises that their policies would lead to faster growth, whereas no, the market didn't believe though the promises from all the statements from the Conservative Party. So I think it does leave the Labour Party very constrained in what they'll let be able to do if or when there is a Labour government. They will, of course, have the option of increasing government spending by putting up taxes. Uh, how far that will appeal to their voters and voters more generally isn't clear, but the fundamental issue is that government spending has to be paid for, and uh, the way in which you pay for it is through taxes. Well, that might be a good point to to wrap up the conversation because I feel like the, we've covered many of the issues that we wanted to discuss. And um, you know, rather than saying there's a, a easy solution out there, I think just helping our listeners be aware of some of the dilemmas and tensions that either party or whoever is in government might face in this current environment is a useful exercise. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you very much for your time and I, I really enjoyed our conversation. Well, thank you very much.